Hi, and welcome to this really special digital event with me, AJ West, the Fountain Bookstore, and someone who just happens to be the world's greatest crime fiction author. Have you ever had a moment where you just feel like the whole world is suddenly on pause, as though everything has just kind of stopped and you're no longer dealing with reality anymore? Uh, all too often that feeling is caused by something terrible happening, isn't it? But sometimes, maybe only a couple of times in entire life, we get to experience a feeling of shock, bewilderment, and complete and utter joy. Well, if you're wondering why this guy sitting in his small rented flat in South London is getting to rub shoulders with Hollywood and literary royalty in this very special series of interviews, then it's because I had one of those moments sitting in a pub just over the road from where I am now, actually, back in September. And it was all thanks to a very special, very generous woman named Patricia Cornwell. I hope we'll get to that story a bit uh, later. But first, allow me to introduce her to you as if you need me to. Now, she hasn't sold a million books. She hasn't sold 10 million books, not even 50 million books. Patricia Cornwell has sold, and I had to read this a few times to make sure I even believed my eyes, 115 million copies of her books worldwide. That's approaching twice the entire population of the United Kingdom. Her books have been translated into 36 languages on planet Earth, uh, and perhaps a few, uh, I think, maybe beyond that, too. They're available uh, in more than 120 countries. 29 of her books have been New York Times bestsellers. Amidst all of these accolades, it's kind of unacceptably easy to forget the most important one of all, which is Patricia Cornwell is an utterly brilliant writer. I've been trying to think how best to describe her writing style, style as I personally see it. And I think it's testament to the way her latest book, Autopsy, has intoxicated my brain, that I keep coming back to visions of flying bullets and slicing blades. But that really is, I believe, why her writing has such energy. The danger, urgency and violence sits in every line, whether a body is being dissected in one of Scarpetta's morgues or a cork is being pulled from a bottle of her favourite wine. It's sharp, it's deliberate, inevitable and so devastatingly quick. Many of you will know that the last Scarpetta book five years ago, Chaos, was rumoured to be the final instalment, but the cosmos has a way of getting what it wants, doesn't it? As a former journalist myself, I can see why the events of the last few years inspired our favourite writer to find kind of some sense to it all through the eyes of the world's most celebrated forensic pathologist. With Autopsy, Patricia brings her series to a landmark book, 25, can you believe, as Scarpetta returns to Virginia, where it all began, no spoilers, before heading to Washington and far beyond for a sequence in space, which frankly just blew my mind. Now, I can't pretend to have won loads of awards myself for my debut novel, uh, The Spirit Engineer. And let's just say, my sales are quite so impressive as Patricia's, but I think maybe that's why Patricia invited me to host this uh, event. I sit here as evidence, exhibit AJ, if you will, that the biggest crime writer in the world is still supporting upcoming writers. I'll make sure we get some answers now to as many of your questions as possible at the end of your chat. And thank you so much for sending them in. They're all absolutely brilliant. Um, but first, Without further delay, let's talk to Patricia. Patricia, are you there? I am here. And um, after, I mean, that that was so well done. I'm not, I don't think I need to say anything. I think that's, that was enough. But, but, you know, listen, I think that what's fun about you and me, because people really do need to know that, that things can happen in the world. You know, Leonardo da Vinci said, everything's connected. You just have to see it. So here's what happens. You know, I am going through my, my Twitter, whatever, one night, and, and I see that this author has followed me, and I go, he looks interesting, and I follow him back, which is you. And next thing I know, I get a, a direct message from this guy, Andy, AJ West, sitting in a pub in Link England, and he was so funny. You were so funny with what you said, and we started this relationship and then I looked started looking at his book his debut book which I have a copy of right here oh. <laughs> and, and I thought now this is one really talented person and so here we are because we look we all started somewhere and what I want everybody to know there's a lot of artists out there a lot of writers um if you really love what you do and you believe in it don't give up on it and the universe will find you the stories will find you, but you've got to be open. But anyway, this has been magical. And Andy, thank you for doing this. And actually, 
I, I wanted to ask you a question because um, in your book, when you're talking, you go into these incredible, this detail about the, the seances and the magical stuff that's going on that actually is really scary to me. It's creepy when you've got your fingers on the table and it's moving your, the clockwise or whatever. How, you know, we talk about research and I have some people who say they don't necessarily think going out and doing a lot of research is that necessary, but I've always been of the mindset that if you experience something, like if you show up someplace, it may tell you something that you wouldn't find out otherwise. Well, how's that been for you? How do you approach your stories? Well, before we before we met, I already had a sensibility in my writing and my research that I wanted to not just read about places in archives, although visits to archives are fantastically exciting mm -hmm. to me um, as a, a history geek, but to actually stand in the locations that the novel set in. So there's a, a scene at the start of the book where uh, William Jackson Crawford uh, tragically takes his own life. It's called Picky Rocks in Bangor in Northern Ireland. I had to go and stand there. I had to feel the, the breeze on my face. I had to smell the sea. I had to know what the sounds were so that I could write it. And the same with the, his place of work, the Municipal Technical Institute. I had to go there and feeling the the space and the character of that building totally inspired the way uh, uh, I write. But what, what I think um, has come across in our conversations, actually, but also when I was reading uh, Autopsy, a fantastic uh, book, by the way, uh, just okay. there's, there's just so much, there's so much I could say about it. But one of the things actually that's really relevant to your question there is, is it just shone through to me your own approach to research, which is, I need to feel that blade in my hand or mm -hmm. I, you know even when you were describing i don't want to do any spoilers but when you're describing that extraordinary scene in outer space um i just thought this is someone who really really has seen this or, or has, has has felt it in, in some way can i ask have you actually i mean have you actually experienced weightlessness yourself because i felt as though you had when you when you wrote about it i have and and even when i'm not drinking i have you know <laughs> <laughs> But um, yes, uh, well, two ways. One, if you scuba dive, one of the reasons in astronaut training uh, they have to learn to scuba dive is if you're underwater, you learn to maintain neutral buoyancy. And it's it's a very close feeling to being weightless, but, but not still not the same because you have gravity. But what you can do on planet Earth is you can go up into a plane. It's a zero G plane um, where it does these parabolic trajectories where literally goes you and like up and down like this. And as you're going up, you're lying on the floor. And then when it's going back down, you're in a free fall and you it's, it's really crazy. I'll be lying there on the floor and all of a sudden you're lifting off the floor. I'd let go of my pen and my notebook and they're floating up in front of me. Um, and it, so I, I did get the feeling. And when you do something for real, you get surprised by something. For example, here's what I did not expect about being weightless. Now, for phys physics, physicists, you really smart people out there, you know that weight and mass are two different things. So in outer space, you're weightless, so you float. And, and you could have a humongous payload that you could move with your fingertip, just pushing it because it doesn't weigh anything up there but it still has mass. So while I'm floating in that airplane doing the zero gravity trajectory, I don't weigh anything and I'm moving around like this, but if you run into the wall, you get reminded that you have mass and you can get hurt. And so it, it all of, I mean, it, you, I mean, you can stand out on a launch pad and it's all this raw metal against the horizon, like at Wallops Island, Virginia. And, and you, what you don't, get from looking at it on the internet is when the wind is blowing through all that metal, it starts playing music. And I call it space music because it's woo, all these weird, eerie sounds. And that's why I tell everybody, look, whatever it is, if you can do it, just show up. You don't know what you might find out. That's just what you, the way you put that there was just, um, so you should be a writer. The way you put that was so, was so brilliant that you get surprised by something. And I had the same thing when I was writing, uh, uh, the seances and, um, I did experience the seance myself, but I also put myself in a room where there was absolutely no light at all, apart from a very low red light, uh, which was the color of light that this particular medium was using. And what surprised me was 
how there were so many sounds in the room that I had not been aware of until I sat there in silence. Tiny clicks, tiny shifts in the building, very, very soft movements of the air. Suddenly I was sensitive to those things in the way I wasn't before. And I suddenly realized whether you believe in spirits or whether you don't, you're never truly silent. Even in your own body, there are sounds. You move your neck and there's a slight click, but you're not totally, was that my neck or was that something else? Um, especially when you force yourself to do it for two hours and there's no one there. So you're right, surprising yourself with things you didn't know before. Uh, when you're talking about space there, I have to say, this is a cheeky question, but I do wonder, we are entering a world now where uh, mere mortals such as ourselves might be able to go into at least the lower regions of outer space. Is that something you're tempted to do? Oh, I'd love to do it. Um, but it, a rocket ride is very, very expensive. And um, if I ever get an opportunity, I would absolutely go up there. And, you know, I, the, the thing that's cool, though, I for four or five years, I've been doing research with NASA and aerospace, you know, agencies and technologies that all go along with it anything from you know rockets to to space planes to to flying cars and things that they're actually working on today and um the, the big the, the, what happens is you realize that for those people going into outer space the astronauts they never go until they go and what I mean by that is all of their training before they get up there is some type of simulation. So if you can be witness to some of that or and get involved in some of it where they put you in virtual reality and you feel like you're doing a spacewalk um, outside the space station and you're looking down at planet Earth, the swirl of blue and white like this marble, I swear you start feeling like you've done it. And I, and, and I know it's not the same. And I did everything I possibly could, not only for autopsy, but the Captain Chase books I did before that to let you know what it feels like um, to be up there. And in Scarpetta's case, she doesn't actually go into space to work this case, but there's a disaster that has occurred in low Earth orbit right above the space station. And it's top secret. She's called to the White House. And astronauts get deployed from the space station to go to this orbiting lab, which could actually happen. And there is such thing as a dream chaser space plane that I talk about in there. And she basically has to remotely help those people figure out what to do once they get in there and, fig and find these people. Um, and, I, and I thought, am I, over, am I overthinking this? I, I was reading that, that particular sequence and honestly, it just blew my mind. I thought just it was so tense. I thought, um, there's a fresh, I can feel Scarpetta's frustration that she is so detached from this crime scene. Mm -hmm. And I thought, is that, uh, is, is that fed from Patricia's frustration sometimes that she can't be in a crime scene when she's wanting to write a particular scene that actually, oh, you know, I've got my research. I know so much more than most people do about these things, but I kind of want to be in there so that I can feel it while I write it. Well, that would be true. I mean, if there were really a scene like that and I could see it, believe you me, I would like to. I'd love to see uh, a, a crime scene in space. Not that I wish for bad things to happen up there, uh, but they're going to happen. Uh, the more we send people up there, the, when we start putting people on the moon, when we start putting people on Mars and beyond, um, there are going to be... There, there's going to be death up there. There's going to be illness. There's, I mean, they're sending more and more doctors, physicians to the space station now for that very reason that we need to be able to figure out how we're medically going to take care of people um, in orbit or or living in lava tubes or habitats on the, on the moon in a few years. So wherever humans go, we will export who and what we are and all the good and bad that go with it. And that includes death, and violence and also accidents, tragedies that nobody intended on. So um, I would love to see something like that, but you know, I was, I, uh, I, I know this astronaut named Jack Fisher, in fact, I, this pin I have on, he gave it to me and he had it up on the space station when he was there. And we talked at great length about physics and what would happen to a crime scene in outer space because without gravity, well, just imagine what blood's gonna do. I mean, it doesn't drip, drip, drip. And when you got fans blowing all over the place, you, it is, it, it, well, I won't say much more because when you see the scene, you will get it. But what I describe to date is exactly how, um, for the most part, how death would be dealt with up there. There's no easy way to do it. And um, it's, it's kind of shocking really, because there's, 
you, you can't just, if somebody should die on one of these orbiting laboratories, unless you have a refrigerated facility, um, you're going to have to figure out what to do with that body. And there's a chance. It's not something that most people would imagine. It's, it's the kind of, it's a really good example of a scene that a writer who hadn't investigated uh, the reality to the same level you have, it, it, you would instantly feel to the reader false. It would, it would, it just wouldn't, it wouldn't live in your imagination in the way that that scene does, the way you've you've written it. To to bring you um, back down to earth, uh, much as I'm sure you hate that, but um, you did ask a question actually just now about uh, my research that I go through and the fact that um, a lot of writers don't perhaps immerse themselves in the world uh, that they're writing about in the to the same extent. Um, and it occurs to me maybe part of the reason for that, and it's something I'm feeling as I approach book two, and I wanted to ask your, your thoughts on this, is that we're under so much pressure to write quickly and to get the next book done. And I, I kind of worry really when I look ahead to the next 12 months of my writing life, do I even have time actually to go and really immerse myself in these locations and to explore these places? Or should I do what a lot of writers do and I think understandably and just get on with writing the book and let some of the details slip as a result. Well, I think that's I think that's a mistake if one th that is best to be avoided if possible. It's a little bit like, look, maybe just to get on with getting married and have children, but I don't want to date you or get to know you very well. I mean, I sure don't want to visit your family or where you're from. I don't have time for that. It doesn't make any difference. Well, yes, it does. When we create anything, it's a relationship that we have with whatever that is. And it will speak to you if you show up. I make sure that every now and then I still go to a morgue. I don't need to see what they do there for the most part because I've, I've seen so much of it and, and I keep up with those things that do change, but a lot of it stays very much the same. But why do I go occasionally? Because to be reminded of the reality of what I'm dealing with, let it talk to me. Um, because it's not respectful for me to think that I can write about something that I have not tried to get to know at all, whether it's doing a biography of a human being like Ruth Graham long ago, or writing about somebody that's up in space, or, or how you're dealing with a serial killer in your neighborhood, or what it's like in the labs or the autopsy suite. And this much I would say to everybody, including you, um, how you do that today is harder, because places are not as accessible as they used to be. No. Um, but I also believe that if you try hard enough, there's where there's a will, there's a way. If you want to do something, if you want to see something, if you want to know something, then what you do is figure out what someone will let you do and inch your way along. Even if it's just, I don't even know what it would be if the person involved will know, but, but don't be told no, figure out some other way to show up. And yes, there's pressure with deadlines, but if you know you really aren't going to have time to do what you need to do during that period of time, I would find some way to try to avoid committing to it. Um, the worst thing than missing a deadline is turning in something that's not what you want it to be. It's that pressure, isn't it, between, uh, or that tension rather, between what you want to do as an artist and a creative and what the business side of what you're doing demands of you. And trying to tussle with that can be tough. I think particularly as a new writer, I find that, um, you know, sometimes kind of stressful to think about it. But you're right that if, um, if I'd have allowed that pressure to stop me from exploring the truth behind my book, The Spirit Engineer, as much as I did, I think I would have, I would have lost, in fact, most of my favorite sequences in that book. And I think the reader's response would have been less visceral. Do you find, um, and do you, well, let me ask you this way, because I know, I know you find with your previous books that um, your readers have a, uh, a really kind of passionate response to the material in those books. Do you mm. think that readers who've read the previous 24 are going to uh, be kind of shocked and surprised by this book? Does it push the envelope a little bit more? Oh, no, I think I actually think that the, the, the original Scarpetta fans um, and they're they're out there. Some of them are still out there somewhere. I mean, it's hard to believe that it, it the series is 30 years old. I hate to say it, um, but I think that they will find with autopsy it it 
brings you back to all the things that worked about the Scarpetta series in the very beginning, the characters, the sense of place, because place is a very important character. Um, in the old days, it was Richmond, now it's Old Town Alexandria, but it's back in Virginia, where she has a huge emotional landscape and, an, and memories and an affinity the same way I do, because that's where I got started, um, you know, as the Scarpetta writer was, was in Virginia. That's where, actually, it's where everything got started after I left journalism because we moved there in 1981 and, and I wrote the Ruth book and then I started the crime novel. So, but you have to move on and show the kinds of things that she might deal with today. And we did, and yes, I want the serial killer, the scary stuff that, that keeps us awake at night, but she with all of her expertise would also be involved with the federal government in terms of she's on the doomsday commission where she's supposed to help our leaders, not just in this country, but abroad, our allies, to what do we do in certain situations? What are the dangers? How do we remedy this? Um, and that could be a lot of different things, including if, uh, when you hear these days about the Havana syndrome, um, there are invisible enemies, ways of attacking people that are not as easy to see. And how is she going to deal with all these new threats, including if, if a virus were ever weaponized? What's the, what's the Havana syndrome? Well, in this country, we've had a lot of news about um, people who are working in the in embassy in Havana, Cuba, and also in other parts of the world seem to be attacked by some kind of high frequency energy weapon. And uh, it's causing, they thought at first it was not something real, but now if you read um, the news about it, some of the weapons that are being developed these days, they're using energy or radio waves or other means of creating tremendous damage, including what they can do to our infrastructure. Um, I mean, there are weapons being developed by enemy nations or less friendly nations, shall we say it a little more diplomatically, that could do tremendous damage to the United States infrastructure or England's for that matter, probably. And these are why this is why we have all this interest in outer space. It, you know, and why when Scarpetta is worried about the dangers in outer space, it's not because someone might get killed up there. That's not what the real danger is at all. Uh, the dangers are people going up there and taking out our satellites and owning everything up there so that we are completely trapped. It's sort of like they hold the keys to the kingdom. Um, if someone takes out the satellites for us, for you, um, that what your GPS, the stuff that guides our military, the telescopes up there that show us what's going on, the spy cameras. I mean, if, if we're not, we're, that's 20,000 miles and beyond we have stuff up there. If if somebody does that, you know, the Chinese have just landed a rover on the dark side of the moon where we'd have no way, uh, you know, the dark, dark side of the moon stays that way because it's always facing the other direction. Um, we don't have anything that I know of up there like that yet. So it's a space race. And the whole thing is for universal dominance in some cases. Um, and while people don't really want Scarpetta worried about satellites being taken out. They, they will understand, I think, when they read Autopsy that what my new mantra is from space to ground to six feet under, because it's basically wherever we go, we're going to have the same problems that we've always had. The, the scope of the novel, um, that it, it starts, I think, in um, what a reader might consider to be classic Scarpetta territory with um, a victim found who suffered terrible uh, injuries and has been murdered and a mystery as, as to how that happened. And then it, it does expand the universe of the book, expands and expands and expands until, yes, we are in space and we're dealing with these huge thoughts, and not just physically, but as I say, these huge thoughts. Um, and, and by the end of the novel, um, I, I almost thought, that how, how has Case Scarbetta not had some sort of panic attack? Or <laughs> Because the, the issues that she's dealing with are, again, you know, very earthbound. So uh, a, a frustrating secretary, who I thought was a brilliant character, by the way. I, I got so annoyed with her, I could have just, ah, I've sorry. worked with so many people like that. Um, <laughs> just brilliantly written but then you go from that to then uh you have some dodgy goings on maybe um higher up in in government and then suddenly you're dealing with these huge thoughts about um yes about about space about space travel about space technologies but also about technologies in the ai world with um you know a i'm going to call them a character who appears in who's in the book who 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 begs huge questions about how much we can trust 
even now the faces that we're talking to on the screen patricia do i know that's you could that be someone else are you an avatar so right. so the themes you deal with are so great and and it um it, it, it's left me mulling it over for, for days since well you know these are the kinds of things that are going on in artificial intelligence um you know everybody's asking uh, you know, what's that going to be like? Well, it's already happening. That's what it's going to be like. It's not something that's out here. It's do, we're doing this now. And the yeah. metaverse where you're people are merging um, virtual reality with reality so that you could be walking down a road and you're seeing cartoon characters while you're doing it. I mean, it's it does make you wonder, are we going to get to a point where how, do you know the difference between what's imagined and what's real? I don't know, but it, but these are things that are going on, like the avatar that you're talking about, the artificial intelligence avatar that Lucy's dealing with. Um, that a NASA friend of mine sent me a video showing that very thing of this bearded scientist talking to the avatar that had been created, and I thought it was a joke at first. I thought that's not an avatar; that's a real person. Oh no, it was not. You sent me you sent me a I you sent, sent me a link to the video and I opened it thinking, okay, this is someone introducing an avatar. And I was like, oh no, no, no. That's the avatar. And, and then, it, it, it says it has feelings, and you know, supposedly artificial intelligence can't learn empathy. Well, it's all in the algorithm, and there's gonna be a lot of mistakes made, but a lot of good stuff made, but it is already going on and 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 i wouldn't write about it if it weren't real but the most important thing is in in the book everything is connected you know we used to have a saying in the morgue that death is no respecter of persons and death and violence don't care who you are and so you could have a murder victim in old town alexandria who seems to have no connection to anything and somehow it's got something to do with something that's about to happen in outer space well and that's life and and if you that is the fearful symmetry of things that's the interconnection of stuff that's the butterfly effect is what da vinci means about everything being connected and i will remind if they don't know people don't know it already the word autopsy the greek root of it it means it the, the greek word is autopsia and what it means is to see for yourself and that is the key to how scarpetta gets things solved and it's also the key to being i think a good writer or a good artist is as much as you can do it go see something for yourself because you'll see it differently from anybody else has ever seen it maybe and it might give you some really great idea that's fascinating. I, I didn't I didn't know that. I mean, uh, if we go back in time, 115 million books, which is a disgusting amount of books to sell, by the way, it's just shocking and amazing. I th honestly, I looked at it, I thought that's I, I don't even know how to put that into some kind of context um, as, a, as a debut author when I, you know, I see my sales and I see the sales of, of authors who are celebrated and who are held up as, you know, you're doing an amazing job. Um, I mean, it's just a, an extraordinary amount. If we go back, though, to your the very beginning of your writing career, I, I presume part of it was learning that, yes, you immerse yourself in a place and you absolutely absorb all the information you can, but then you have to go through this extremely uh, painful, let me say, mortifying process of then actually discarding an awful lot of that information, because otherwise you're writing a textbook, not, not a novel. And, and I wondered whether you had any helpful thoughts or creative hints for, for new writers as to um, how you can sculpt the information you've gleaned into a plot rather than allowing that information to take over. Well, I think if you're going to be good at anything in life, you're constantly teaching yourself something. And at the same time that we need, like if you're going to write about a scientist, then, then go do things or read stuff, learn what it's like to be a scientist. But if you also are a writer or you study other writers, you can also learn, go look at what someone else does. You know, I mean, look at Hemingway or anybody that, I mean, I like, I bring him up because I think his descriptions are just so amazing when he, the way he describes things. And so as I can see it when he's saying it, um, but, but go look at something and look at how other people handle information and learn. Um, I do it still. I have certain books that, that I will look at because I, I love the way they handle 
the, the relaying of the information to the reader in terms of a really skillful way. Thomas Harris is a good example. I think Silence of the Lambs is one of the most skillfully done crime novels, you know, ever. Or, or Truman Capote's In Cold Blood. Um, and you get an instinct, you know, when you're describing stuff, if you start feeling this is really dragging on, chances are it's really dragging on. But it's a learned skill set, and you keep learning all your life if you want to. You know, I keep hoping I'll get better. Um, I mean it. I mean, I, I sometimes I think, wow, that's the best book I've ever done. And then later I go, wow, I still have so much to learn. And then you start realizing you made mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes. There are things I've done in some of my earlier books that I would do differently now. I'm not sure what I would do, but I wouldn't do what I did. Is that, is that right? You, I was going to ask, when you've written um, you know, so many books over a series of 25, you will inevitably have those you prefer for, what, for whatever reason. But are, are there creative choices that you look back and you think, I probably wouldn't, I wouldn't have done that now. I'd have found myself at book 25 in, a, in an easier position to tell a new story if I hadn't have made that choice. It's also that you find out in the, re the readers obviously matter and you find out that surprise surprise that sometimes when i've thought the readers would really like something that i did turns out they did not like it at all um i'll give you a good example after i finished the jack the ripper book i thought you know it'd be such more it'd be much more cinematic if i could write a scarpetta book from the third person point of view so i could show you what everybody's doing mm -hmm. and i thought mm -hmm. the readers would really like that well they didn't like it and i but i didn't I, Actually, nobody told me for several books that nobody, the readers weren't liking that as much. Um, and, and so I switched back to, to first person point of view, which is what, of course, autopsy is told in. And some one of the readers um, made a comment that I'd never thought of. This person said, I love it when it's in the first person point of view because it makes me feel smart. And then I realized that they're feeling they are the character while they're reading it and the other thing is you know instinctively if it's i i i and you're with scarpetta that you're safe with her it's okay to go in that cooler it's all right go go on to the railroad tracks with her go down in that basement if you must you'll be okay as long as you're with her and you write in a way that um works so beautifully with uh, the reader's own uh, mind. I, I, it's hard to put into words and I've been kind of struggling over how exactly to do it. But there are times when someone will say something and Carpetta, case Carpetta will hear it. And then she'll question, question what they've said in exactly the way I already had as the reader. So you've almost read my mind. So I thought, hmm, that doesn't make sense, or I don't really get that. And then Scarpetta will think exactly the same thing. And then I'm in. Then it's like, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a magic trick that you, you, you play really on the reader, I think, Patricia, because it, it, it kind of fools the reader into thinking, oh, this must be me then. This book seems to know exactly what I'm thinking, as well as what these characters are doing. That's the must, is, that, is that a conscious thing? Or is that, is that really. just... The... Not really, because, you know, having been around these real types of people you, you know whether it's a forensic pathologist or detective or secret service agent or uh, some big politician whatever it may be they're humans they're people and people wonder and think and are and imagine pretty much all the same things within a certain you know sort of array it's it's and so if i'm going to wonder it and you're going to wonder it well she's going to wonder it scarpetta's going to wonder it if, if someone says you know, well, the, the blah, blah found the body, the caretaker. Um, well, and he said that she was dead. Well, the Scarpetta's can say, how do you know she was dead? I mean, I've seen people, prosecutors get up in front of a bunch of people in a class and say, I don't, I don't know how you tell somebody's dead. You put a mirror in front of their face. I don't know. So those questions that, that the, it's really good old Sherlock deductive stuff is what you're talking about. You wonder and you ask, well, how did that person get in the house? Or why would that person assume that someone's dead? How do you know? Have they been dead for a long time? It's just the same stuff. And you're a journalist. I'm a journalist. We're recovering journalists forever. It's the kind of questions you should ask if you were interviewing somebody. If someone said, well, I went in the house because I saw the body lying on the floor through a window. Well, how'd you get in? Oh, you you, have you make it. You make it sound very simple. I mean, the truth, though, actually, is I think a lot of people who try to 
who might try or maybe have tried to emulate that writing style will have found themselves struggling actually to have that clarity of mind, that blade-like uh, confidence as to, I know what someone's thinking right now, I know what the question is, and I'm going to put it down on the page. And it seems to me, having read your your um, earlier books, uh, uh, you know, from post-mortem onwards, um, uh, that that was something that was already in you. I think a directness and a certainty about what you were thinking and a confidence that's probably what other people were thinking too. And that also gives you the confidence to do something creatively. We'll come to the we'll come to the questions that your readers have sent in very shortly, by the way. Thank you for being so patient while I, while I fumble through mine. But um, it strikes me that your journalistic sensibility but also your confidence that you know the questions you want to ask has led you to ask a very big and current question right now, which is obviously to do with COVID-19 and the world's response to that. A lot of people creatively I've seen are shying away from talking about it because they feel as though it might date their book or they feel as though it might be too political or their own opinion might come across and it might annoy people. Um, you're clearly not worried about that at all because Scarpetta is quite clear where she stands on things. Uh, particularly mentions of PPE and, and that kind of stuff. Um, was that something you troubled over or not at all? Well, first of all, as you mentioned earlier, you know, my last Scarpetta book came out five years ago, Chaos. And I, I wasn't going to write anymore after that. I mean, I decided after that that I quit. I, you know, I quit Scarpetta and I meant it. Um, I gave away, um, I had a bunch of these really expensive forensic books and pathology books and things that they, that, that, I gave to libraries and stuff because I said, I don't need this kind of thing anymore. And I'm not doing that anymore. I'm doing space stuff now or whatever. Well, then I, I, you know, I did the two space thriller books. Spin came out last January. COVID is got everything shut down. Um, I mean, including even the publishing industry, everything really slowed down and nobody was really sure what to do next or what commitments they want, might want to make to anything going forward. And I had some time to think. And I imagine what would Scarpetta do in this world? Not only do we have COVID, but we have the raid on our capital. Um, I mean, well, that was a little bit later, but the kind of divisiveness that is starting mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. over masks and the politicizing of something that, that should be never, never should have been politicized. And I just was started thinking about this and I wondered what she'd be doing. And I started getting in the mood to, to start playing around with it. And if it hadn't been for COVID, I wouldn't have written this book. And I wanted her to be in exactly the world that we're in. And the book opens literally on November 30th of this year. Um, and I had to guess a little bit about what it was going to be like. But uh, for, other than Robert E. Lee's statue still being up in Richmond, because it was when I finished the book, but now it's not, um, it's pretty much things the way I describe them are pretty much the way they still are. And I just, um, it's not what the book is about. It's just the ambiance. And of course the impact that it's had on Scarpetta and her inner circle, because they have been touched by COVID also as, as have so many people, but it doesn't dominate the story, but it certainly has an impact on it. Um, the nice thing is Scarpetta is used to wearing masks. So if we see her in one, it's pretty normal anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Um, do you do you feel ready now for me to read you some questions from sure. from yes. your readers? And it's a real honour, actually, to to those who are watching. Thank you so much for allowing me to ask your questions for you. Um, I'll start with this one. Was it difficult bringing Scarpetta back to Virginia in autopsy after many years away? Why did you feel that was the right move for her at this point in the series? I, I believe taking her back to Virginia is returning her to the cradle of her civilization. It's the fabric that the series was originally woven from. I am more comfortable with it because it's my emotional landscape too. I know Virginia. I lived there 20 years. Um, the series got started there. The books that were rejected were written there. I was in the morgue there for six years. Um, and I know that terrain and I, and I, it's a very rich landscape. And I thought, but, Northern Virginia is not something I was familiar with. And I knew she shouldn't go back to Richmond. I thought she needs to be closer to Washington at this stage in her life. But to answer your question more fully, it took me a while to get to walk in her moccasins again. I sat there and I worked and I wasn't sure where she was. At first I had her on the space station. 
I had her whole scene with her up there and it wouldn't go anywhere. And finally it was like, she taps on my window and says, I don't want to be up there. Just, I can handle it from down here. Okay. Uh, uh. I said, that's fine. It'll be a lot less complicated if we put you back down here. So, and then I saw her, I saw her standing before her window in her office, her new office, looking down at people she doesn't know, many of whom don't want her back or didn't know her to begin with. And she's got a whole nother conflicted situation that's very, that very much like it was when she was getting started as being kind of the new girl in town that nobody wants, only she's the new old girl, old girl in town that most people, a lot of people don't want because they've had a lot of years to build up their fiefdoms and their political networks. And the last thing they want is her coming in and setting everything straight. That's so interesting then that you actually uh, first had Scott Better on the space station and then brought her back. And, and creatively, that instantly adds so much more tension to that scene that otherwise wouldn't have been there. Listen, I could talk to you for another four, half an hour just about that, actually. Maybe we will at some point. But I have to crack on with these questions. Um, another reader here says, what led you to write your first Scarpetta novel? Well, I decided I wanted to write crime novels after I'd done been the police reporter for the Charlotte Observer. And then I wrote the biography of Ruth Graham. So I said, I like writing about crime and I like writing books. So what if I wrote books about crime? And I had never really read much of anything along those lines. So the first thing I did is I went out and bought an Agatha Christie. I think it was sparkling cyanide. And I was trying to read, how do you do a, a mystery novel? How do you put this together? And I did exactly what you said. Um, in the early days of trying to do this, I'd have 20 pages describing every iota of an autopsy that nobody wanted to see and it overwhelmed everything. And you, you know, you learn. Um, but I knew um, the first time I walked in a morgue when I was trying to start writing crime novels, when I saw what went in, I didn't see an autopsy the first time, but when I heard what went on in there and what people can tell from the evidence left behind, which is a little bit like an archeology span dig. You've got little flecks and pieces of stuff that might tell, reconstruct an entire civilization and how they lived and how they died. And that's the forensic world. That's the world of the invisible or the stuff that's not readily visible anyway. And I just, that was something that intrigued me and I wanted to, to explore that and do it through the eyes of this forensic pathologist. So interesting that you started with Agatha Christie because actually, uh, if I if I may call it a friendship, started with Agatha Christie too. I don't know if you know that, but oh. the tweet well, the tweet you responded to was a picture of me in front of the Agatha Christie statue, of whom I'm a great fan, in that Soho is. in London. I had walked past that statue. I stopped about five minutes later. I thought I need to go back and take a picture with that statue. I don't know why today I've walked past it a hundred times. But today I'm going to go and take a picture with that statue. Agatha and is the root of all of this. You know that, don't you? It she's just watching. blame it. I mean, that should be the <laughs> name of my memoir. Blame it on Agatha. I somehow yeah. think Agatha's got her. She's she's pulling all the marionette strings up there. <laughs> she is. Well, good for her. I'm very I'm very grateful to you, yes, Agatha. We're very Agatha. grateful. Carry on. Yeah, you can write my next book for me if you like. Um, uh, question three: The food throughout the sky. Ah, oh, the food. Ah, uh, now, I. I, I, I like my food and my wine. And so I love this question. The food throughout the Scarpetta series has always been amazing. Are there any new dishes in the new book? Yes. We, um, in, in, her, in the new book, I tease you with her secret garlic bread. And, and I'm going to tell you something. I have had <laughs> this garlic bread because Stacy makes this garlic bread in real life. And, she, and she, there's one ingredient that she that's in it and she won't tell me what it is and she hides it in the cupboard so i can't find <laughs> it and i've looked for it trust me i'd say and I, I i'm beginning to think it might be crack cocaine because when you start eating that garlic bread you can't stop but i do have i, I have something about that in the book and i've learned the readers get really upset if they don't have cooking in the book you've got to have food in there somewhere because they love her food and they want and really it's 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 kind of i mean i always end it with the meal Everybody's finally together and they're having her cooking. Um, it's sort of like the Sopranos, everybody's at the table in the restaurant. But it's also my way of saying to everybody, come and join us. You're welcome at our table and let's tell you a story. Oh, that's how I felt. Absolutely. I was there eating the food and I wanted to taste the, the garlic bread too. Well, I'm surprised. When, when you come visit us, you'll, you'll get to taste it. 
I, I hope I hope so. I feel slightly let down that the author of the Scarpetta series can't work out what's in the garlic bread, though. I feel like Case Case Scarpetta would. She'd have it down the lab in about five minutes in a petri dish. I think she and Stacy talk together, and they don't tell me what they say. That's what I've decided. Um, question: What was the most interesting piece of research you came across when writing Autopsy? That's got to be a tough question. So much of it was really interesting, but I, I think that really exploring how a, a death scene would work in outer space was the most interesting. Yeah. Um, and, and, and when I say outer space, we're not talking about the moon. We're talking about maybe 250 miles above the planet, um, you know, where the space station and satellites and uh, some things like that are, but you're still in a totally different environment. The biggest difference again, being that you, uh, there's no gravity really microgravity or basically no next to no gravity and so you can imagine if someone throws his weapon well imagine that you know you toss it in the yard when you run past a house that you just burglarized or whatever well it won't work that way because it's going to float <laughs> um, well do, or, do you know what you were saying earlier um, that's a really good example i i totally do not understand what you're saying earlier about uh, was it mass and velocity or something you that have if you, no weight if, but you still have mass so for example if if you you could be on the space station and you could pick up um, a piece of equipment that weighs 500 pounds. You could pick it up light as a feather. Now, if you shove that to go yeah. move it to the other side of that module, that it when it hits whatever it's hitting, the mass is still there. It's floating, but it is still a 500 pay, pound mass that, that if it hits you, you will feel it. And it's really so, so same thing with a same thing with a knife, same thing with a bullet, like it will still just as it would. Oh, sure. I, I mean, you, you can shoot. Um, well, if you shoot a bullet, like, let's say if you shoot a bullet inside a, a space station or a spaceship where you, you don't have any gravity, but you've got a life support system, the, the bullet is still going to just travel the way a bullet does. Um, I mean, it's it's but but if you if, if the bullet wasn't moving and you let it go, it's going to float out of your hand. I mean, it's it's I know it's hard to wrap your mind around. But the biggest yeah. thing is that when you're when you're simulating, when you're floating um, and you don't feel like you weigh any, you weigh anything. It's the same thing if you're underwater, if you're floating as a scuba diver, you're swimming along and it's you don't feel like you weigh. I mean, you can rest your fingertip on the bottom of the ocean floor and just hover right there. With all your weight on a fingertip. Now, if you went running into the side of a sunken ship, you, you may be floating, but you're going to be reminded that you weigh 150 pounds or whatever it is. Um, and or if that thing, if something hits you, um, so I think I get it. I think I think I get it. I'm, I'm clearly I'm not intelligent enough to be an astronaut. I have a feeling I'd be running into blunt objects quite often if if I was up there. But I, I think I get what you're saying. Um, but the way you describe the the blood, the way it's moving across mm. the face, like almost I imagined it almost like red mercury, and and in the atmosphere um, like ground pepper. I mean, just all of that. I hope that's what you'd say because for me, the research you've clearly done that was my favorite bit. So oh, that, amazing. And, and and it is pretty much the way it would work because I've I've talked to people who've been up there, and the biggest thing is understanding how fluids um, move in outer space because a lot of people may not realize this, but when you're doing blood spatter analysis and uh, all the forensic geeks out there love all this stuff, uh, it's physics of fluids all has to do with the way gravity moves a fluid like blood. If you drop blood at this angle or that angle, it's going to look different. And it's all about the good old Isaac Newton's laws of physics. And so if you take a fluid in outer space where there's no gravity, well, that law of physics isn't working the same way anymore. So if, if you have someone bleeding, what, what happens is, let's say I cut my hand badly up there, instead of blood dripping everywhere, as best I understand it, it actually follows the surface tension of your skin and will almost start crawling up your arm. And if you put yeah. your hand in a bag of water, because they keep bags of water up there, if you put your hand in a bag of water, that water will start crawling up your arm like ectoplasm. That's and, so creepy. That I stuck mean, with could, me. It could suffocate you if you couldn't get away from it. Um, if you don't have fans blowing up there, the carbon dioxide that you exhale will form a bubble around your head and, and it will suffocate you. So that's why they have air blowing all the time inside something like the space station. So 
all of these things I had to learn, not because the reader wants to necessarily know all this minutia, but you have to learn it so you understand scientifically what that crime scene is going to look like. It's uh, it's it's so creepy, and I think there was one image you you painted with uh, with your words that was, uh, I think uh, there was a blood spatter on one of the um, victims' eyeballs, uh, which really stuck with me. Um, now. <laughs> Well, because it's so visual, right? You write in such a visual way, which I think is one of the one of the greatest compliments I think any author can show people hear. what it would look like and um, and do it in a way that makes you feel. You know, everything is about making people feel. But someone once told me the only reason people go to the movies is so they feel something, and it's true. If you don't feel something, why would you keep wasting your time on it? And it's like like in your book. Um, when I'm reading one of the, the, a seance scene, I mean, I feel the fear. I feel the fear of this unknown, whatever the hell is going on here, and where you somebody wants to flee the room. Um, and I get it. And then what happens is, because you made me ping off of that and feel something, then I remember being about 12 years old and visiting one of the neighbors in this little teeny town in Montreat, and the girl she had a Ouija board. Now, in my little evangelical town, you did not have Ouija boards. And one night I was over there having a slumber party and she pulled out the Ouija board. And I remember putting my hands on that thing. And I remember it started at one point, it moved. And I'd swear if my hair could stand straight up on end, it did. And I, I ran out of that bedroom and said, oh, I don't, we shouldn't be doing this because it felt real to me. I felt something strange. And so I felt that all over again when I read your passage this one particular one about that. And that's what I want people to feel when, they co when they're reading what I'm doing. I want them to feel what I've felt when I've walked into a crime scene and seen a body on the floor, seen blood everywhere, seen the reality of something so horrendous that someone's here one minute and they're not the next, but to tell it in a way that's not hopeless. Cause that, you know, but you gotta make people feel. Sure, it's so it's so resonant. It it really is, and I, I think when you're talking there about you know painting pictures and uh, reason people go to the cinema, it leads us on quite nicely to the last question I've got here from one of our readers, which is, um, I know it's a question a lot of people have been asking for a while, really, which is um, the Scarpetta making it to TV or uh, onto the cinema screens. And they say, I heard about the new Scarpetta TV series being developed with Blumhouse and Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah. who's also obviously chatting to you as part of this series. Any news that you can share on who will be starring in that particular series? No, I can't. I, that, I think it's a little early to know the answer to that yet. Um, Jamie, uh, I mean, and by the way, I could not ask for anybody more fantastic to work with than Jamie Lee Curtis. And I've, I've know, been privileged to know her for a number of years. And uh, beyond just being this amazingly entertaining actress, um, and creative. She is a very logical, um, a little bit like Scarpetta in the way she thinks, quite honestly. I mean, I've been places with her where she's telling me what to do for security. Oh, don't go standing over there. Now, if you do that, this could happen. And I'm looking at her like, I thought I'm the one supposed to be saying this stuff. <laughs> she's, but, but what she will do is that we'll build this kind of from the ground up. You got to find the right people um, for however a show like this gets made. But the point is to have a series for TV um, that very much captures the DNA of Scarpetta, but to be told in a way that makes sense today. You know, what might've made sense 10 years ago or 20 years ago, is it necessarily how someone's gonna translate this material today? And that's what's gonna be fun for me is to see someone else's spin on it. How do you feel about the possibility of them taking your character Scarpetta and turning her into something quite different from what you wrote? I mean, there's a whole conversation going on around right now about whether there could be a James Bond who doesn't look the way he's always looked, maybe even a female James Bond. What if they started kind of creatively exploring or experimenting with Kay Scarpetta to the point where she's not really the character that you see on the page? Would you be comfortable with that? Well, there's some things, no. I mean, it, it, if there were fundamental things that were changed, I would not be comfortable. But based on the people I already know involved, um, that's not likely to happen. I mean, for example, the biggest thing that I, I, I couldn't tolerate is if you make her personality something that is just not who she is. Um, one mantra I have is that she must never abuse power. 
So if somebody decided to make her kick ass and a bully and that she does snarky, nasty things, I would be very disappointed because that is not who she is and she doesn't need to be that kind of person to get the job done. She just doesn't. She's too powerful to need to be petty. Um, or if you have her doing stupid stuff, like going to a crime scene and getting her makeup bag out and getting the tweezers and picking up evidence. And I actually had somebody wrote something like that once in a script. And I'm like, um, no, and a thousand times no. <laughs> so, you know, but again, I'm involved in this. I'll be involved in this. Um, and Jamie's really smart. She will pick smart people. The more likely thing to happen is if you get somebody who really is good at this, uh, like a showrunner, for example, um, then they will bring out qualities in Scarpetta that I can't show you in my books. My readers are pretty strict with me. They don't, there's some things they don't want to see. They don't really want to see Scarpetta in a big meltdown. They don't want to see her and Benton having a big rip roar and fight, even though they do sometimes. They, they don't let me in the room, but I've heard it through the wall um, cause they love each other. And, but there'll be things that in a theatrical presentation that I think the readers will get to see, and it should be more of something, not instead of, or a disappointment, but an added dimension to what I do in my work. That's what I'm hopeful of. And I feel like that's what we're going to get. Well, I wouldn't want to be the producer or director that has to say to you that they're going to change something fundamental about case Scarpetta because you are the expert and, uh, you know, you're someone creatively who's shown such certainty of mind um, for, for an extended period of time and never really kind of lost your grip on that. And that's no doubt uh, why um, our, our autopsy is book 25 in this series is, I have no doubt whatsoever, going to be every bit as huge as uh, its predecessors. I think that comes to the end of our time. And that makes me sad because there are so many things I would still like to talk to you about. Um, we'll do, but, uh, we'll it, do more another time because I think there's, um, I love the idea of someone getting, you're, you're sort of where I was many decades ago, getting started in all this. And then here I am today, but the truth is you and I talk about this when we're just chatting, that we both feel the same. We feel the same when we sit in this chair. We feel the same when we're working on a book. We feel the same when one is coming out. And it's important to know that all of those things that, that people feel, just because maybe you've had some success at it doesn't mean that it goes away. You still have to get up every day and try really hard. And That's you really don't inspiring. have to read any of the other books to read autopsy. Not You do not have to. You'll understand it perfectly. That's that's absolutely true. And that's, do you know what you just said there? I think it's going to be really inspiring. It is to me and it is to other uh, writers just to hear someone who is um, so phenomenally successful and, and known around the world uh, for her books and the confidence in her writing to know that you also sit in front of a laptop and fret and worry and think, is this is this possibly good enough? Um, I've I had bad book reviews and I've had books that didn't do well and I had ones that didn't get published and I've had um, a series that I did where I was asked not to do any more of them after three. I, I've been around and around chasing the tail of this and I follow a lot of writers these days, uh, artists and stuff on social media and trying to see what people are doing and also to say, hey, you know what, don't give up. I've been there. Um, I'm still there. I mean, he's launching this new Scarpetta. I don't know how it's going to do. I hope people will have a great time with her again. But the point is, we should all be supportive of each other. That's really how it should work. And if everybody would do that, the world would, you, the world would not be such a mess. Okay, well, thank you so much for um, your time talking to us. So we have to say thank you as well to um, the readers who sent in fantastic questions um, on this book. And I, I'm sorry I couldn't get through to more of them. Uh, there were so many. Uh, thank you for watching. And a big thank you to the Fountain Bookstore who've hosted us um, today. Well, for now, um, I'm going to hope, Patricia, that we can talk more in future. And uh, last but not least, thank you for taking part um, in this video live. Thank you. Thanks for doing it, Andy. It was great. See you soon.